Welcome to this uh, symposium uh, here at the Physiological Society. My name is Charlotte Haig. I'm an Associate Professor in Human Physiology at the University of Leeds. And when the proposal came out to hold symposiums um, in this fantastic space, I thought, what a wonderful opportunity to try and link the science with something I'm really passionate about, which is public engagement. Um, I have probably now 10 years' experience as a practitioner in public engagement, linked also with my academic role at Leeds. So what I want to do is bring together both people who are engaged in, in the engagement side of um, working with the public, but also the scientists who could perhaps learn new ways to try and capture different audiences that they've, they've, they've not been, they've not managed to um, portray their science to before. Okay, what I thought I'd do as an initial welcome for anybody who's new to public engagement. Um, I put the National Coordinating Centre's public engagement definition up on the board. So it's sort of a myriad of ways of um, activity, working with higher education and research, and sharing that with the public. So it's very much a two-way process. It's just not about disseminating work. It's about listening also to what the public have to say. And the goal is generating this mutual benefit. So I borrowed this diagram from one of my colleagues. I slightly changed it. My colleague works within patient public involvement, which is another element of public engagement, and just tried to draw some of the key aspects, I think, that make good quality public engagement. So mutual respect, trying to build ongoing relationships uh, with the public. It should always try and be a positive experience where at all possible. And we're encouraging different backgrounds, because different backgrounds have equally valid expertise. OK, so we think that these are the indicators of quality engagement right at the top. It's purposeful. You're not just doing it on some hunch that you've got an idea of an activity that you think you'd like to do, and you're just going to co-op the public into it. You have a purpose for it. You're thinking about... Um, what, what you're trying to achieve. You know, are you trying to inspire young people to study your discipline? You know, are you trying to develop um, a, a co-produced research project? You know, th those purposes are different and naturally will lead to different outcomes. So, for example, with co-production, you won't want a massive audience necessarily, but with inspiring school children, you may well. Okay, so the purpose is important. The people, so we had that, didn't we? You need to think about the people you're engaging with. And where possible, engage with them to inform what you choose to do. You know, there are lots of experts who engage with the public. Teachers are an expert who engage with school children. So if you're going to develop stuff for school children, it would make quite a lot of sense to talk to them and engage with them and think through what actually works for them. What are they interested in? What do they want to bring to the engagement activity? And then the process. You know, what type of activity are you going to do? Now, loads of people start here. I've just got a great idea. I'm so sold on my idea, I'm now going to inflict it on people. And then, sometimes it works. Sometimes it works. But often it doesn't work. OK, and then right at the heart, we think evaluation is critical. Absolutely critical. Not just to work out whether you've had any impact or any effect, but also to work out what you're going to do. So using it formatively to inform what you're going to, you're going to do. So, uh, right and left, it's embarrassing. OK, purpose. The NCCPE broadly defined three main purposes for engagement, um, just to make it kind of easy to talk about, really. OK, so informing, inspiring people with your research, sharing what's going on, um, consulting, actually going out to find out what do the public think, Collaborating, working in partnership, potentially over a longer period of time, to do a mutually beneficial activity together. So, three purposes. Lots of audiences, lots of people. Um, I, this diagram is meant to just help people think about, um, you know, is it... Nearly all public engagement um, is aimed at the general public, as if they're an undifferentiated group of people who are all the same. And clearly that isn't the case, and there's lots of tools you can use to segment your audiences and understand better, but the more specific you can be about the people you're trying to involve, the more likely it is you'll create a quality engagement experience with them. So there's the public, and then around that there's things like communities of place or communities of interest. Um, there's the media as a, a route to engaging with audiences. The public sector, including schools, cultural and leisure services, 
you know, there's a policy community, community in third sector, and then the business community. And all of these are important, but you need to be a bit specific. So you need to look at, okay, this is the research I'm going to do. Which of these people are going to be the most important people to engage with? And then choose that and work with that, rather than trying to engage with everybody. So I think that Pathways to Impact is your friend as a scientist if you want to make a difference with your research. It helps you and prompts you to prepare a fertile ground for impact. It makes you think about it at the beginning rather than at the end when you're ready to disseminate all the great stuff you found out. It supports you to develop quality engagement. It allows you to draw down resource to do this really well. And I think quality engagement means purposeful. You need to think about the people involved in it. And then you need to explore the process and you need to use evaluation as a tool throughout your development of the engagement. And it enables you to demonstrate impact if indeed you had some impact. I can't do a science, Kaylee. I asked and I realised there's not very much space. But one of the things that we associate, I, I do is a song which is called Fiddling Around the Brain. So it's using the fiddle to explain basic neuroanatomy. I'm sorry, I've forgotten to put the frontal lobes on there. get kids singing this song. Uh, I have to say it's very, very cute. And uh, it was good. Well, thank you for uh, humoring me. But you can t I guess I wrote this, the, the song actually for a, a, a competition. It's called Fame Lab. It's quite a good competition, which is, is basically trying to communicate concepts within three minutes, which anyone knows is a very, you, explaining anything in three minutes is very challenging. So I realized the song is the, usually the perfect three minute soundbite to communicate things. But it's really, really fun to get people thinking about it. And I guess one of the advantages of, of using your passions for public engagement is, well, first off, one of the things is it's, it's, it's great because you're using your own passions and in some ways it's, it feels a little bit like cheating because then I can just sit there and write a song like that and call it work. 
Um, that's amazing. But secondly, especially at least when it comes to things like music or art, or the things that people are intrinsically interested in, you know, I, I usually ask kids, well, how many, how many of you want to be scientists? And a few of them put their hands up. And how many would like, you know, like music or, or want to be musicians? And a lot more people put their hands up. And I say, well, what, what if you can be both? And what's nice about this way of teaching neuroanatomy, I guess, is that because you're contextualizing it within music, you also make it actually a little bit more approachable. So instead of, for example, I mean, maybe the song doesn't represent it perfectly, but the frontal cortex, instead of just necessarily saying, well, it's for high functions, so well, how is it involved when you play music? So, you know, the temporal cortex are involved in listening to music, the motor cortex is involved when you move, uh, the visual cortex is when you're reading music. I mean, it's contextualizing it in a way that, especially for younger audiences, perhaps, it makes it a little bit more interesting. But, I, but actually, even for, for older audiences, I mean, the amount of people who come up to me and says, I've gone to so many Kayleys and I've never been saying anything as geeky as this, and this is great, you know, sparking discussion, and that's fantastic. Because you're, you're embedding it in something that people are already interested in, and then you're kind of sneaking it in the back door. Um, but they don't know it, but they've engaged in science. That's great. girl was so interesting I didn't really think I liked science um, a mum I wouldn't think this store like this could get kids so inspired and interested I had to practically, practically drag him away a teacher it's so nice the kids having so much fun but also learning your interactive approach really facilitates their learning and another mum I love it that you guys are volunteering, appreciating that students are doing it in their own time for their own particular love of science and the wish to sort of engage uh, the community with it. What about the students? So this first one's comparing Big Bang Festival versus the uh, community festival. Stark contrast to Beeston where little no knowledge of anything scientific due to the age of children, which I found hard to adapt to at first. Enjoyed adapting my method of communication to the older, more knowledgeable kids. Sorry, students at a Big Bang event. So realising that you can't do the same thing to different audiences and learning to adapt. And they're great at sort of being inventive and, and learning different ways of communication. So um, teach neuro, uh, neurotransmission to young children. They turned it into Chinese whispers. One was the brain, whole string of neurons, and then the foot at the end. And you can have great fun sending you know, different messages down or changing the speed or having two sort of strands and see how fast neurotransmission goes down two different strands. You know? And this is what the students themselves have designed. They enjoy communicating science and getting something from uh, that engagement. So, so fulfilling to keep a group of 13 to 14 year old boys um, to have them come away saying they've learned something, give positive feedback, they enjoyed the event and what they taught them interesting. Got a leak here. Um, and again, um, it enthused them with their own degree, you know, with their own subject. So I gained so much from the day, I came back feeling enthused, passionate, and appreciated how much I enjoyed my degree. So as students themselves go into the wider community, this is uh, another example where we're engaging both the public's and the students with faculty research. So this was something that Charlotte and I ran a couple of years ago, uh, funded by the Wellcome Trust, which was a, the Physiology and Pharmacology and Ethics of Performance Enhancement. So we took over uh, the exhibition space of the City Museum, and then we ran a variety of stalls um, from cardiorespiratory changes during exercise, wheelchair basketball, lactate thresholds, me obviously doing my ethics stuff. And all these stands were manned by undergraduate volunteers. Um, both individual stalls, but also the, uh, yeah, the feedback, enticing people in, uh, etc. This is my latest uh, thing at this. This is a project that we, um, I've got grant from the Alzheimer's Society to engage the public with the faculty's research into Alzheimer's disease. So as part of that project, again, we took over the City Museum a couple of weekends ago, and we again catered for everything from five-year-olds up to people are 105. So basic brain function, psychologists doing reaction times, biomedical scientists talking about their research, again, at you know, cellular, subcellular levels, um, 
how the body works, and then me around the corner doing a bit of citizen science. So we had thought walls where they could give their views on Alzheimer's research, the harms and the benefits, what direction they should think research should actually go into it, should we actually fund Alzheimer's research again. And so this is again an undergraduate student here explaining or, or let, uh, giving the student the opportunity to uh, have a go at chromatography uh, there and me letting them rip a torso model apart, which they actually love. So, what do we get from it? Very good, engaging education for the whole family. Particularly from the students, they appreciated how good the students were. You know, brilliant, motivated, enthusiastic, encouraging to visit it, and sharing information, thank you. Key point, something that university should do more of. What about the students themselves? Again, a lot more confidence. Wasn't very particularly good at talking in front of people. Realised that you know, involved teamwork, communication skills. Found myself stumbling a lot less. Much easier to convey ideas to people of all ages and understanding. So they, they're learning as they went through. Never thought I'd be able to relate to children in a scientific manner. Rewarded when children were inspired and excited by the science we were explaining to them. Really enjoyed myself. Look forward to participating more even possibly leading the event. New found interest in science. This is a biology student who didn't actually do any Alzheimer's research, or you know, Alzheimer's uh, knowledge in, in a degree, who's now actually gone to start looking it all up and, and, and learning all about it. So why should we actually have, summarise, why should we actually have public engagement activities within the curriculum? I said there's limited opportunities out there, uh, but you think about it, the ones I've shown you, the science projects, comm projects, the pop-up science, the engaging, you know, the larger public events, it's enabling our students to develop key skills and valuable experience. From a faculty's point of view, it's enhancing our student experience, attributes of our graduates, and it's promoting both our faculty's teaching, but also our faculty's research. From a personal perspective, it's a, a, using students is allowing me to massively expand not only the volume of public engagement activities I do, but also the type of it as well. It's engaging the public, not only sort of typical audience, you know, schools, etc., but the wider public, particularly those that usually engage uh, with science. Our students are ideal role models to promote science and science careers to people their own age, rather than sort of older people like myself. It's enthusing our students with a passion for science, with a passion for their own uh, subject. And most importantly, it's another example of an active partnership of working with your students to develop their own educational experience. presentations from me about public engagement before because I always include this slide which is Henry Welcome. It's, uh, um, I, I like including him because Henry's own interest really shaped the work of the Welcome Trust today. So not only was he a pioneer in terms of pharmaceuticals but he really was fascinated by the historical, social, cultural context of health and medicine. So yes we fund biomedical research, that's you know, most of our money is is, is spent on that. But medicine and culture is a key focus area of the Wellcome Trust. So we talk about must do public engagement, where public engagement is essential for, the, for that piece of research. So that's really where the engagement would be part of the research protocol. It's um, to, uh, yeah, as it says on the slides, to either secure ethical compliance or recruit study participants. It's not really the type of public engagement that we've been talking about today. It's a, a different type. It's the must-do public engagement. And there's the smart-to-do public engagement, uh, which is directly relevant to the piece of research, um, but it's, um, it's not the research protocol. So it's about, for example, it gives benefits in terms of um, enhancing your research through new perspectives, giving you communication skills, the kind of things that we were talking about this morning, again, raising your profile and career inspiration. So again, that's very much personal to, to you as an individual researcher and your research project. But then there's also the wise to do engagement that kind of benefits more broadly, um, where we think it's important for research to be part of a broader culture conversation and to inspire future generations of scientists. So that's just how we rationalise public engagement in terms of when we talk to our research community. And it's, it's 
I should say that this model was produced with our, it was actually one of our research directors who came up with it, so how he made sense of public engagement. Um, this is our assessment framework. So this is at the end of a, um, a program of public engagement or a public engagement project. How we assess whether it's, um, we think it's been successful. Now, I, I should say very clearly that public engagement, when you're evaluating public engagement, we think it's very much important to think about what your aims were. You know, what, what were you trying to achieve and have you achi achieved those? So exactly what falls under these criteria of impact, value for money, quality and reach will depend on what you are trying to seek to do. Um, but broadly speaking, impact is about change. You know, so have you had a change in terms of knowledge, behaviour? Um, have people been moved? Have there, is, has there been um, any yeah, skills acquisition, as it says there? Value for money, because we want to make sure that we're spending wisely, so we do um, look at that. And then quality. So um, we, really, we think it's really important that the public nature activity is a quality experience, so that you know, people engage with it in a way that... Um, yeah, so we call it production values. It's a, a term that if you're in from the kind of um, either entertainment sector or the museum sector, you'll be familiar with. Um, we obviously, the content has to be rigorous. Um, the reach, so we think about the primary reach for the, of that activity and then the, the secondary audience. But again, relative to what the aims of the project were. So these are kind of we're not saying one of these criteria are better um, weighted more or other. These are just what we're looking at at the end of a project. Um, and we, we have this in our grant um, expectations, um, kind of information that we give to our grant holders so that they're aware um, that they can use this as a way to um, evaluate their activity. But we don't, we think that there's not one size fits all in terms of evaluation methodology. There's a whole plethora of approaches out there. And is kind of rich social science research that you can draw on um, and, and that's, that's really important in terms of evaluating your activities. So figurative language, we use it on a day-to-day -day basis, whether to express an emotion, her eyes sparkle like diamonds, or to maybe explain something. The flow of electricity in a wire is like the flow of water in a pipe. If you increase the size of the wire, you reduce the resistance. If you increase the size of the water pipe, you reduce the pressure. So we use it on a regular basis. However, you have to be cautious when you are using figurative language especially in public engagement. So in my talk today, I hope to go through some of the criteria that you need to take into consideration when using figurative language. So this can be attributed to public engagement. So this is what Einstein had to say. You do not really understand something unless you can explain it to your grandmother. Now that's something doesn't necessarily have to be the nitty-gritty detail of a subject. It just means the key principles or the bigger picture that encompasses it. Metaphors. And here's one example of a metaphor. It's the instructions in a cell that defines the function of the cell, which in turn defines the function of the uh, tissues, which in turn the organs. The function, structure and function, it defines who you are. Fantastic. But there might be other interpretation. Some people may not even understand what a code means. So you need to have a context. When you are using figurative language, there has to be a context. So you might have to go through explaining what a code is. Where's the coding that takes place in the cell? And where's the decoding that takes place in the cell? Let's move on to the next example. Similes. So here's an example. The mitochondria are like batteries. So they can provide energy. The mitochondria carry out chemical reactions. Just like batteries, they carry out chemical reactions, electron transportation that takes place 
in both of these, okay, and they produce energy. However, there might be a misconception. Some of the audience members might not know what a battery does. Because if you ask, I, mean, I asked somebody actually at Costa Coffee today, um, and I asked them, what do you think a battery does? And they said it stores electrical energy. No, batteries don't store electrical energy. That's the misconception that some people may have. So if you are going to use a figurative language, make sure you are able to identify and eliminate any misconceptions that the audience may have. Batteries store chemical energy and then converts to electrical energy. And the final example, analogies. We use analogies all the time. Lots of theories out there are best modelled through analogies. Okay? And here's a very simple model, the planetary model that defines what an atom is. It's a very basic model. Okay? The nucleus of the atom represents the, the sun. The electrons going around, the nucleus of the atom represents the planets going around. That's a very basic model. That's all right for primary school students, maybe GCSE students and below that. But how about students or maybe people that are higher up? Okay, try and explain that. Try and model that. Try and explain something as complex as that. This is what's actually happening in an atom. These different orbitals, okay? And these electrons going around randomly, not in, not in, a, a, fi not in a defined orbit going around randomly in different energy levels, okay? You can use a model to explain that as well. I tried it using a theatre. So in a theatre, you have stalls, you have balconies, you have uh, boxes, and different number of people representing electrons can occupy those different spaces. But not everyone has actually visited a theatre, so they won't be able to connect. You need to find another example. Okay, football stadium, all right, the football stadium, the center of the pitch could be, represent the nucleus. The tracks going around or the, um, the stadium where people, the, the seating area could represent the different shells and you can have a different number of people occupying those spaces. A lot more people can now connect, they can relate to that because football is universal, right? Not many people might not have gone to a theater. So the solution, first of all, you need to know your audience. You need to know a bit about them, you need to know their prior knowledge, and then you need to pitch it at the right level. And then you need to put things into context. Right? So have a brief background. And once you've done that, then try and identify and eliminate any misconceptions. So Derek Muller, he has a YouTube channel called Veritasium. Okay? That's what he does. He goes around asking people in the public, so can you tell me what gravity is, please? Right? And he you know, determines all the misconceptions that people might have, and then he tries to eliminate those mis misconceptions there and then. Okay? So that's what you need to do that. And then you are now ready to use the figurative language. And you shouldn't only use figurative language, you should also include practical demonstrations as well to make it more effective. Reinforced one of the things I wanted to talk about, which is the huge gulf between sort of corporate uh, communications and individual communications. Uh, my blog, dcscience.net, gets uh, well, on, on an ordinary day maybe a thousand visitors a day, on, on a really good day, 10,000, or records 23,000 in one day. Um, it's probably been largely responsible for removing the five Bachelor of Science degrees in homeopathy that existed in Pitt universities in this country through information tribunals and by revealing what was taught on them um, through the Freedom of Information Act. Um, this, I suppose, is not the sort of behavior. What, but the interesting thing is that nobody here appears to have heard of it. That's a really interesting bit because you're doing quite a different sort of public engagement. And here are some examples. These are things that I take down on, on my blog or on, um, on Twitter or both. 
they're bad enough. Science magazine put out a tweet for a paper just quite recently about the garbage truck that clears metabolic waste from your brain works best when you're asleep. It had 1462 retweets, but no one had read it because it's behind a paywall. And that the pharmacology element of it used two millimolar prazosine, a beta blocker. Now, if you're a pharmacologist, you realize that the, the um, equilibrium constant or the, the, the Michaelis constant for the, no, sorry, the equilibrium constant for the block of beta receptors is less than one nanomolar. So this is a concentration at which you would act as a local anesthetic, not a beta blocker. But this was buried in the legend to figure three of the paper. It wasn't obvious even if you're a pharmacologist. Um, this, this, this came in the Altmetrics Top 100 for 2013. It was number four in their list. And uh, at the Science Online meeting, there was a lady from Altmetrics doing their usual commercial. They're just trying to sell the product, of course. And I asked her if she'd actually read the paper, and she said, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, it, it is just a, just a hype and, and, and dishonesty. Number two on the Altmetrics Top 100 for 2013 was um, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Our new post focuses on trial that shows Mediterranean diet results in less cardiovascular events than low-fat diet. So we won't quibble about the less rather than the fewer. Lots of retweets, huge study in the New England Journal of Medicine. Mediterranean diet is shown to ward off heart risks. That's just a sort of, all the diet faddists, of course, immediately latched onto it without having reading it, because again, it was behind a paywall. Not one of these tweets mentioned the fact that these diets had no detectable effect on myocardial infarction, no effect on death from cardiovascular causes, no effect from death from any cause. The only difference was that the number of people who had strokes, and that was p equals 0.04. If you understand statistics, one of my recent blogs is about what p equals 0.04. It means, it means you've got at least a 50-50 chance of being wrong. This sort of promotion, that's the, new, that's the thing in uh, the New York Times about, um, uh, well, about the dishonesty of science. And that is greatly exacerbated by the behavior of glamour journals who put out press releases which are highly misleading. And it is very contingent on people involved in PR and universities that they aren't part of this. At the moment, they are. They, they are complicit in releasing hyped up press releases which mislead the public and which get science a bad reputation and please stop it. <laughs>
um, public engagement as an umbrella term. Um, so technically, patient engagement would fit within our understanding of public engagement, and arguably industry engagement would as well. But I put public engagement as a box, which to me it means um, collaborative research, it might mean um, dialogue events, it might mean conversations and communication. So for the purposes of this slide, and this slide only, public engagement means a subset of the umbrella. And the traditional interpretation of this is often that um, those roots map to those impacts. So if you want to do wealth creation, you need to engage with industry. If you want to make people have a better time in their life, you do public events. Um, if you want to work to get health and well-being to be better, you do patient engagement. And I would argue that, yes, that can work, but actually I think this map looks more like this. Um, that if you <coughs> want to um, improve health and well-being, yes, you can do that by working with a patient group, but you can also do that by starting a dialogue about whether you should be eating GM foods, whether we should be putting a tax onto sweets, whether we should be um, making all of our children do six hours of PE a day. Um, you can also do public engagement to start that. And you can also do industry engagement. Health and well-being doesn't have to be the general population. It can be on nuclear power plants taking appropriate precautions. Um, should workers be having standing up and sitting down desks? Does your research show that? Can you work with industries to facilitate that? So, that's, that's just the one that is closest to me, which is why I use that as an example. But I think, I always say to our researchers, if you hate impact, often it means you haven't found the right type of impact. So you might really, really hate school kids. And if someone keeps pushing you to stand and talk in front of a group of school kids, obviously you are going to have a terrible time. But it also might be that you haven't found the right pathway to impact. You might hate talking to people. You might prefer to um, do collaborative research because you love research and you don't have time to talk to people and you want to fit everything into one and do an awesome piece of research with a patient group. So this is how we approach it. This is how I think it can work when done well. This is a, a lovely um, utopian view of it. I appreciate that. I appreciate that it's not always that simple, but I thought we'd go with um, what would be really nice. My name is Harry Witchell. Uh, I'm discipline leader in physiology and I'm going to be at Brighton and Sussex Medical School and I'll be talking about measuring engagement moving, using moment-to-moment -moment tracking of postural correlates by video analysis. So most organizations and probably everyone in this room knows you're forced to, to measure engagement where your organization wants to measure engagement. Most public engagement is measured with basic or remote metrics, that is footfall or attendance, or hits for, for web pages, hits and pime on page and also feedback forms. Uh, all of these are limited, so for example, people can be in an audience and be bored, that would be seated politeness, or people can be on a web page and get, be getting coffee, which will look like a long time on page. So in this particular case, what we're doing is we're looking at deeper analysis, looking at moment-to-moment -moment interaction with screen-based stimuli, so these are things like tests and online reading, to distinguish engagement from boredom. And we and others are me developing measurement techniques to, to do this. So we did this with motion tracking, so we're looking at human-computer interaction, we're using handheld trackballs, that means that they're not using a mouse, so they're not being forced to move in any particular direction. We've got a set of discrete stimuli, each stimulus lasts about two minutes plus 50 seconds of loading time. They range from very interesting to very boring, they're consistent, controllable, and well-established in our laboratory, and they're tested concurrently with subjective measures such as the VA at visual analog scale. They're filmed from a lateral aspect. People are wearing passive motion tracking markers, and we're filming at 25 frames per second. Then they're video tracked with Kenovia, and then finally we analyze with MATLAB. So just to give you an idea of what we're actually talking about, each one of these is, uh, so these are two different time, uh, time courses. So on the x-axis is time, y-axis is some kind of position. Here we're talking about position of head movement. So this is tilted back, tilted forward. There's a 50-second baseline. And then here's the two minutes of the interesting stimulus, and you see that there's not that much change in movement during the main stimulus, whereas in the baseline there's quite a lot of movement, it, compared to, say, a boring, a boring event, which is quite boring. But the, for the rest of this talk, what I'll be talking about is I'll be summarizing these time courses. So this is just a piece of data, a person looking at a single, uh, a single event. Um, so this is an example of how approach isn't always engaging. So this is a person <laughs> responding to extreme boredom. And we're following uh, motion tracking, the forehead, the ear, and the shoulder. But we've also got two tracking guides here, which we've not followed for you, just so that you can see what they look like. So there's a greater trochanter in the thigh. And to 
to give you an idea, so the issue here is postural position is a problematic measure of engagement. So approach is not always engaged. So there's two kinds of boredom that we can think about. People don't always talk about them, but it seems obvious on, rec on thought. There's aroused boredom, which is associated with escape or restlessness, and passive boredom, which is more associated with resignation and lethargy. And I'll give you an example of why this is important in terms of how close you are to the screen. So here's somebody who's watching. This is one volunteer who's interacting with an incredibly boring quiz. And you can see that he's quite far away. He's practically pushing himself. It's a little bit squeezed here. But he's practically pushing himself away from the screen like this. He's leaning back as far as he can. This is the same volunteer with the same stimulus all of uh, one minute later. So you can see that there's, he still is bored. It's still as boring as it was before. But his position is completely changed. And so if we're talking about looking at using head position as a way of judging engagement, plainly this is not really what's going on with this particular person. So our conclusions for the moment are for seated human computer interactions for two minutes. So a lot of things in psychology often involve six seconds, but for two minutes. Proximity, that's mean distance to screen, is a poor metric for engagement because bored people have a wide range of positions, and I do mean literally range. Engagement is associated with non-instrumental movement inhibition, so the relevant issue is net movement, not position. Non-instrumental movement inhibition, NIMI, can be detected by standard deviation of two second ranges. And finally, in the future when we talk about this, we'll be talking about measuring two kinds of boredom and two kinds of engagement. So when people are bored, they can either be physically active, which is a restless boredom, or they can be physically still, which is lethargic boredom. Likewise, with interest, there's physically still and physically active. And when we're talking about screen engagement, often what we're looking at is the difference between rapt engagement, that's associated with non-instrumental movement inhibition, so they're physically still, versus restless movement during boredom, which is more, more movement. While we're setting up, uh, as Charlotte says, my name's Catherine Matheson and I'm Director of Programmes at the British Science Association. So I think what the purpose of this session is to uh, think about some of the opportunities that exist for researchers and science communicators to do some of what, they, what it is they want to do around public engagement. So I'm going to focus very much on the kind of practical things. Uh, briefly, I'm sure many of you will be aware of the British Science Association, previously called the BA for many years, um, and for many of you, you'll be familiar with our um, raison d'etre, which is to provide platforms for scientists and the public to get together and communicate effectively. Um, some of you may realise that this vision is slightly different from the one that we've had for the last few years. We've been through a process of organisational refreshing and renewal, and we've been looking again at our corporate vision, and so you've got a bit of a sneak peek, I think, um, of the new vision which is very much about placing, uh, wanting to place science as a fundamental part of culture. So uh, I think what we've been doing for many years is trying to bridge a bit of a gap between science and society, and now we really want to target that gap. We don't think that gap should be there. We think science should be part of everyday culture and society in the same way that other areas of human endeavour, like politics and like music, are. So our mission is very much focused around kind of attacking that gap and trying to build a community of people who, who feel themselves engaged with science, who might call themselves a scientist even if they don't have a job being a scientist. These are uh, volunteer-led um, groups of scientists and engineers or people interested in science and engineering who get together to put on events for their own local communities. British Science Week until very recently was called National Science and Engineering Week so a bit of a name change there um, and the idea of British Science Week is that it's a 10 day long week uh, in March every year and the idea is that people all over the country even if they don't do any science normally they do a bit of science in science week it's everyone's chance to do a bit of hands-on science and so uh, the idea is that we help to lead this campaign on behalf of the much wider science and engineering sector so I encourage you to get involved if you don't already do things for science week I think there's lots of opportunities has anyone been to the festival that's just happened in Birmingham yes great did you have fun have you recovered yet? We had a great time in Birmingham uh, last week. Um, we are still counting up the numbers of people who came to the festival and the numbers of kind of media mentions and stuff, but the top line figures are looking really healthy. Um, you can see on the left an article that appeared on the BBC to do with research about Stonehenge, which was very popular. Um, and you can see on the right here a talk by Helen Chersky um, uh, that was a sort of lot, one of our live events in the evening. Some of you may be familiar with the Crest Awards, which is our programme, our flagship programme for secondary schools, um, which is the equivalent of Crest Awards, but for the primary age group. 
And actually, the Crest Star resources are used not only by primary schools, but also often by community groups like Brownies and Cub Scouts and things like that, because the, the resources we provide for Crest Star are very much, um, I was going to say idiot-proof, that's a really rude word, but they're kind of, you can pick up and run with them. You know, the idea is you don't need to be a science specialist to do them. The Science Communication Conference runs every May for professional science communicators, so you might well include yourselves in that group. Um, we are particularly looking in that conference for examples of innovative practice in public engagement. So we divide, we, uh, we traditionally divide the programme into kind of discuss it, debate it and do it. Um, and I, you're welcome to submit proposals for any of those three strands, but particularly around the Do It session. Some of you may be aware of our programme of Media Fellows. So these are placements in the media for practising researchers. So there's actually 11 this year, but I picked out the four who, whose research interests I thought would be of most interest to you. Public Engagement Unit was set up as one of the beacons of public engagement that Sophie talked about this morning in 2009 and the aims of the beacons were um, as kind of uh, discussed to um, create public engagement as embedded in universities so UCL particularly wanted to work with audiences it hadn't worked with before um, I'm just going to check my notes for exactly what they wanted to do um, better connect UCL with its local area as well which is something it wasn't very good at um, and to increase the support for uh, engagement at UCL and that worked quite well, actually. And so in 2011, when the Beacons funding ended, we got uh, funded centrally by UCL to continue in existence. So we're very lucky in that our university uh, supports researchers internally through funding to do public engagement. Um, and we have about eight members of staff who look like this. It's one of those stupid diagrams. Um, but just so you know, there's quite a few of us. And we really work to try and get uh, public engagement embedded into departments. These three people over here, these weird acronyms are schools at UCL. So we have people specifically working in schools. We also have someone who works very much on evaluation as well to make sure that we learn from what we do and that we can share what we do with other people. Um, thanks to Gemma, who is our evaluation officer, that's where I get all my facts and figures for this talk from as well, which is very handy. Um, and then very quickly, what we currently aim to do, so we, these are new aims we wrote recently, um, the kind of the key words are highlighted. So it's all about a culture of public engagement, embedding public engagement as a value, providing opportunities for people to come along and do engagement, um, and making sure that it all fits within UCL strategic aims. We're very lucky to have just had a new provost who's very keen on public engagement. Um, so he's luckily supporting that, and hopefully it's going to get put more into the UCL strategy. Um, and then evaluate, learn from, and share. So here I am sharing with you all. In terms of this triangle of, of, of um, types of engagement, UCL very much tries to fit into this one, the collaboration side of it. We try and get our researchers to do um, research, uh, engagement that is kind of conversational stuff. Um, the case that I'm going to use today is more this one, but that's because I find that it's much easier to convince people to do this one than it is to do this one, because this one takes a lot less time um, than the collaboration side, if you're new to it. So, um, we kind of try and pull people into this one by starting up here and getting them to kind of enjoy it before they have to put a bit more time in. Okay, so just a little bit about me. Um, I work as the events coordinator, which means I provide opportunities for engagement. Um, I do things like providing opportunities at festivals. Thank you, Ellen, for supporting us to go to Green Man a few times. Um, and uh, doing engagement in uh, museums, this is at the Natural History Museum, and also doing events at UCL. This is at one of our museums at UCL, this is a, a talk event. Um, and I work with researchers across the university from uh, math. Uh, what are our departments from physical science to medical science all the way through to the arts and humanities as well and a lot of our events and in fact um, I think all of these um, there were people from all those different disciplines coming together and um, so it's not just focused on on one part of the university. You still wanted to engage with people who it didn't traditionally engage with and one of those big groups of people um, was people between the ages of 25 and, and 40 and um, the kind of people who had left university but who hadn't um, kind of got to the age where they decided they wanted to come back and go to lectures um, at UCL which is kind of a, a general public offer at the time. Um, so lots of people put their heads together and thought, you know, what could we do? Um, and one of the things that was decided upon was, well, people of that age group also correlate with people who go to comedy events. Maybe that's a nice, maybe that's what we can do, maybe we can link them up. Um, and also, handily, um, we were looking for a way to train our researchers as well, to give them the skills in public engagement. And one of the main things that people lack, um, we find, is the confidence to communicate their research in a way that's accessible. 
Um, I think as the gentleman we saw about earlier, sorry, I've forgotten your name, um, it, sometimes it can be very difficult to actually talk about um, your research in a way that um, makes sense without dumbing it down too much or, or kind of using metaphors that don't make sense. And sometimes there can be a bit of a fear of how to do that. Um, so by doing something that's so um, kind of alien as doing stand-up comedy, um, actually can be a way into doing that uh, without it being too difficult, oddly, um, because you have to already, you're already thinking about doing something totally alien, so you have to rethink how you're going to talk. And then when you go out and talk to school groups or you go out and talk to just another type of adult audience, you've already got that mindset of kind of changing what you say to the appropriate audience. So we thought comedy might work for that. So what is the impact on the researchers who take part? Well, because we, luckily, because we um, evaluate quite intensively Bright Club, we um, have quite a lot of quotes and, 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 and interesting information from people who've taken part. And it can kind of be split up into three main areas. So the first area is um, impact on skill development. Second one is on confidence. And the third one is about this kind of interdisciplinary network of, of colleagues they get to come into contact with. Um, in terms of skill development, the main skills that we get is, uh, are things like um, public speaking, um, communicating, um, and, you know, that's kind of what we're going for. Um, and it's about, you know, making people, encrypting people to go forward and do um, engagement in various different um, formats. Um, in terms of confidence, the confidence actually a lot of the time comes across when people talk about in their work life. Um, what we like to do is draw on our membership. Um, which is why we offer um, our grant schemes. And our grant schemes, basically, we just want, um, we want to raise the profile of physiology and make people recognise what physiology is. Because, like, a lot of um, physiology departments and universities are closing down, so people don't really recognise, oh, I do neuroscience, I, I'm doing phys physiology. Um, so we kind of just want to raise what physiology is. Um, and um, through our grants, we think it's really important to... Um, Get, our, get researchers to have the skills to communicate their science. So this is why, how we try and support them through this. Um, so we have two types of grants. We have our outreach grants and our public engagement grants. Um, our outreach grants are only open to members, and so they get up to £1,000 um, for a physiology-related activity, um, and they're given out every month. So if you want to apply, you've got to apply the month before your activity, so we've got a month to review it. So if you wanted to get involved in these grants, we can partner people up. So we do a lot of things with schools. I have lots of schools contacting me, and then I'll contact our local um, members in that area. We'll put them together, and they can submit an application together. And that goes for any institute as well, or organisation who wants to do an activity and get money through this that way. Um, and then our second um, grant scheme is our public engagement grant. So um, these will be opening in the next couple of months, so they are up to £5,000, um, and any ideas are welcome, so I'm sure you're all very inspired by today. We've contributed to bigger projects. I think um, Lewis talked about Edinburgh earlier, so we, we funded that, some of that. Uh, we contribute to Chaos Science Roadshow, which is a roadshow which travels around from Cambridge to Southampton and parts of Wales um, with hands-on activities over about seven weeks. Um, Science Slam, which was... Um, that was held in National Science and Engineering Week and it was basically kind of like um, Fame Lab where each researcher had about six minutes to talk about the topic and they, had, they could use props and things like that. We put teachers together with members and they go into schools and do activities and people are looking to do activities at festivals so we just funded um, the Cellcraft Challenge, which was a really great activity, which I love, where they use research images to create lots of things. So there's crochet, there's clay, there's badge making, um, and then a theatre performance at Green Man Festival last year. So yes, Biology Week is run by the Society of Biology, so it's a week-long activity, but the Friday is highlighted specifically as Physiology Friday. Now the remit of what the Physiological Society do with that is either any way of promoting physiology, so whether that's in your institution or outside of your institution. So I thought I'd like to do a bit of both. So I wanted to take our undergraduate students who are studying human physiology at Leeds and first of all get them to know each other because that's a bit dif difficult in a much larger faculty, so get some sort of collegiality between them but in a way that we called it Physiology Challenge. So we set them up in teams, teams of at least six students. They had to be at least a member of Level 1, a member of Level 2, and a member of Level 3 Physiology. 
They could couple the rest of the team out of people within biomedical sciences or even outside of biomedical sciences. It didn't matter. Essentially, what they did the first year we ran it was they were all within physiology. Uh, it was uh, just for physiologists. And we wanted them to think about outreach, but also think about physiology. So we got them to go into the students' union, into the foyer, and deliver an hour-long sort of science busking event. So they could have use any of our materials in our labs, or think about anything they've done practically, or they, they enjoy learning about, and communicate that to their fellow students, not necessarily scientists. neither a researcher nor a scientist. Um, I, I'm a digital project manager, so I build mobile applications for a living. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to see, I'm a geek, so I consider myself a geek, and I wanted to connect to other people who perhaps are also passionate about sciences, but, um, you know, and there wasn't really a destination where I could go. Um, I mean, I go to a lot of events that are very scientific driven, um, a lot of um, science community based, and they're really great at engaging scientific s stakeholders, but they're very bad at engaging ordinary mortal people um, who just like the sciences. So I thought, well, um, I've got this idea, and uh, I approached GeekFest, um, which is a um, festival that was crowdfunded of Kickstarter originally, and I uh, thought, okay, go ahead and do it. So I, I was hoping that I get maybe 50 people through the doors and, um, you know, maybe someone would share it online. So I had 900 people turning up um, over the course of three days. And uh, the crowd surprised me because I guesstimated that's quite a lot of um, average geeks, you know. Um, we're thinking of them as, you know, male, white, you know, wearing glasses. So this is our misconception of a geek. Um, and they, w they were so different. I mean, we had a massive... Um, just geek presence in general. There were t Taylor Swift fans, um, there were um, gay, um, a lesbian and transgender people, um, a lot of moms with kids. So the people that you don't normally expect to turn up to you and, and you know, it was fascinating how diverse and inclusive it is. So one of the points that I wanted to make is I think diversity is very important. And uh, Lewis pointed out that, um, okay, so how, um, how do you keep the crowd, the diverse crowd engaged and how do you keep them involved? Well. We have this label called Maker, so essentially instead of um, a charity, a scientist, or um, a hacker, you become a maker. So essentially it's a festival um, or an event for, for the makers. And uh, we kind of joke about it being a B2B event, and B2B meaning brain to brain. Um, so uh, what I'm, I'm looking for is I'm looking for um, partners, sponsors, anyone who's interested, um, connect with me at Future Tech Track. Um, the website is futuretechtruck.com, um, so um, send me a note. And uh, other thing that I wanted to say is I think there's quite a massive gap in terms of funding. I know we talked about funding a lot and uh, the ways... I mean, I'm a very big advocate of crowdfunding, and I think when, you know, whenever some of the people I work with, I mean, some of them are NASA scientists, you know, some of them are general, you know, kind of garage scientists, um, they go, well, you know, we can't secure public funding, so we're thinking of going to um, online um, facilities and online platforms, which I think is, is very important. And um, so one of the things that you could do at Future Tech Track is you can pitch your idea to the crowd, um, connect with the people alike, and uh, secure new followers before you actually go to Kickstarter or any other platform. Yeah.